saying crime go around gambling facilities goes up 10% per year, every year. And here's the result, right? The, the claim is it's gonna create economic development and jobs. The reality is there is no evidence for that. Wall Street Journal on Super Bowl weekend comes out with a, an article saying, quote, the delays in sports betting means that sports book are one or two plays ahead of millions of viewers. So streaming sports gamblers are quote unquote dead in the water. The growth rate in employment in those economies was lower than the growth rate in the economies without casinos. So it's not adding jobs and it's not improving the economy. The whole notion of economic development and jobs is a marketing campaign. It's not supported by the evidence. Colleagues and I go back over 35 years working on these issues, uh, starting uh, with the economics. I remember uh, when gambling was first coming to Illinois, uh, uh, our governor and other officials had some of its academics sitting around a table, said, take a look at this. Looked great for about 15 minutes. And then the econ professors, the government professors, the business professors, the law professors, we all looked at, the, at each other and said, this is legalized fraud. This is nothing more than legalized fraud. It's gonna create the, what we call the ABCs of gambling now. A, new addicted gamblers, particularly kids now, they're focused on the kids. B, new bankruptcies up 18 to 42% according to the uh, official uh, uh, numerous uh, studies and crime increasing 10% per year every year. You heard earlier about Earl Grinnells, who was at the University of Illinois at the time, uh, Professor uh, David Mustard, uh, and they came out with this terrific, uh, after it was almost 10 years that it took them to do this, including regression analyses, very academic, a report published in 2006 by Harvard and MIT saying crime go around gambling facilities goes up 10% per year every year. And they've come out with the follow-up just here in the last 14 months, which is in the Illinois Law Review, with which you're familiar. And that, their article in there uh, by, Mustard, uh, by Earl Grinnells and David Mustard uh, says uh, that it's continuing um, in a different uh, context. Uh, the radius, I think uh, you said, John, was 64 miles. And uh, they're showing uh, increase in property crimes, approximately 8%, and uh, violent crimes, about 12%. So the crime goes up every year, which is intuitive. People lose their money, they're gonna resort to crime. People lose their money, they're gonna go bankrupt, personal, professional, and business bankruptcies. Now, here's the problem. How do you get this information across to other people. You all know these numbers. You know these statistics. If you were up on the hill yesterday, you would have seen that I held up the cover of Newsweek. Newsweek gets it. The major media get it. The media over the last few years all get it. There have been series in the LA Times, in the Washington Post. We actually have in, a, in our documentation here at the Washington uh, Post is editorialized at one period, 38 times within 38 months, uh, for uh, against gambling. Why? Because it doesn't work because of all of these negatives. I've had press people call me up and, uh, and our office uh, staff and say, can you tell us anything good about gambling? We can't find anything good about gambling. I said, well, it makes the owners rich. But that's it. So there really isn't anything good about gambling and here's the bottom line on the economics. When they say that it increases tax revenues the academic studies for over 30 years, not by me, by colleagues and reputable people, Nobel Prize caliber academics, says that in fact for every $1 in new revenues you've got coming in, the, new, the, the social costs are at least three to $12. Three to $12 for every $1 coming in. That's, all, that's the only number you have to remember. 
That's the range of studies. There's not one reputable study out there that says that gambling is good for tax revenues or on a strategic level, on a regional level. It doesn't happen. The other thing is, and, and, and here's the, the good example, if you have a slot machine, it takes out, according to the industry standards, $50,000, that's, that's very, very conservative, per year out of the economy. Well, the multiplier of three, that's $150,000. Bottom line, that's a lost consumer job at the pharmacy, at the department store, at the grocery. And by the way, the Las Vegas professors, Las Vegas professors at UNLV come to the University of Illinois and others and, and work together. And they indicate that around these gambling facilities, people are spending 10% less on food, 25% less on clothing, 37% have raided their bank accounts in order to gamble. There is nothing economically good about gambling. Now, why do I get impassioned about this? For the same reason you do, I get tired of listening to the deceit, the deception. As academics, we are supposed to go for the facts. And if I'm wrong, and I haven't had a reputable academic say I was wrong in 35 years, or my colleagues, we got 98, 99% of academics on our team, people who are politically and religiously diverse, but they're academics. And they know that these numbers are indeed correct. Now, how do you counter the fog that's out there created by the gambling industry with their billions of dollars? Well, we come up with study after study after study. But you haven't, you're well informed and you haven't seen a lot of these studies. So what do we do to help this process? Well, to help this process, we, take, we took these studies, and by the way, half of the professors that I'm talking about are now deceased or retired. So the question was, among our faculty, how do we preserve and extend the life of these economic principles? Economics 101, Business 101, Law 101, Good Government 101, Good Politics 101. Well, we take the studies and we're going to put, you don't even have to read the study, we're going to put a summary sheet on the front of it in legal format that congressional people in our country and in the UK are going to recognize like that. This is authoritative, this is academic, so you don't even have to read the report, we're going to give you the summary, we're going to give you the abstract right up front. And wait a minute, then what are we going to do? We're going to collect the 100 best, well, maybe the 150 best, and we're going to put them together in a nice, big, old, fat 1,500-page volume. And then we're going to do this every couple of years. And we're going to put the best ones out there, and they are 98% negative on gambling. And they verify the crime statistics that John indicated, Professor uh, indicated earlier, and others have indicated here, that Lucy indicated, and we're going to put this out every couple of years, and we're going to make it a nice big old picture perfect for the TVs. We talked to our marketing professors, they said, make it red, black, put gold on there, this is going to look great on TV, this gives you, auto and, and what did Liz say? Nobody ever reads anything except the titles, right? So what are the titles? Well, let's look at some of the titles on these, on these, on these volumes. And by the way, everything in here, uh, if there are any royalties, they go straight to charity. And my colleagues and I, we don't take any honorarium or consultant fees on these issues. This is total, pure academic. So what are some of the titles? Uh, well, first of all, we have the, the Gambling Executive Summaries and Recommendations, which is 300 pages long. It's got great stuff in it. And I want to thank Alex and Jim and some others who were actually back here saying, that book's too big. They open it up and they take pictures of the pages that they want. 
Post them. Put them out on the web. This is pure academic information. It's in the public domain. Put it out there. So what are the titles of some of these big old fat 1,500-page books? Gambling with National Security, Terrorism, and Military Readiness. There are 300 pages in here of different reports done for the Pentagon on gambling in the military. Didn't know about that, did you? Well, when CNN saw it, they did a 45-minute special on it. So this is good. And, and the, uh, the uh, uh, Earl Grinnell's and Mustard Crime Study from Harvard and MIT is in here. Other studies from Harvard, all the, the Tier 1 universities, and from around the world. What's the next volume? Gambling with Crime, Destabilized Economies, and Financial Systems. This, this is big time stuff from an economic standpoint. There's strategic economic problems involved in this. Remember the credit default swaps? Remember the subprime mortgages? Well, and what was handed out here is one of my op-eds in the New York Post say, watch out. The gambling industry is trying to create the same type of problem, only their credit default swaps are going to be based on not subprime mortgages, but on bets. Nothing. There's nothing there. They're creating financial instruments based on which horse runs the fastest. There's no, no asset there. Do you think that's going to destabilize a strategic economy? And this has been mentioned in congressional hearings. The Congress hasn't quite got it yet, but it's, it's been mentioned. What's the next volume? The Gambling Threat to Economies and Financial Systems, colon, Internet Gambling. Welcome to the Internet Gambling. And by the way, several of these were, were published starting in 2009 up to 2013. How do you get, and they're in the legal format, you just have to get them in front of the decision makers and the lawyers on the other side who are so intimidating. They will fold like a wet noodle. They'll fold because we have the academics and, and, and then they'll say, they got three criticisms. Well, is it relevant? It sure is. It covers every issue that's been mentioned in this conference. Uh, number two, is it authoritative? Yes. We've got professors from all over the country and the world in here. And they're authoritative. We're not reprinting the junk science that's being put out by the gambling industry. You won't find a single one of their PR materials in here unless it's as an example of bad research. Um, and then finally, is it current? Well, then they'll say, well, that's 2009 or that particular volume was 2013 or it's just not. A, what, what you're hearing here from Lucy and others and John is the current research, which are just the, the leaves on the tree. The tree's there. They're just adjusting the figures. And they're all bad. I haven't heard a single ornament or, or leaf or branch going onto the tree that operates to the benefit of the gambling industry. They do not pass academic scrutiny. So, the other thing that came up is, well, I'll tell you what, let's just finalize this and put out the Illinois Law Review, 14 professors, nine articles, blue ribbon academics, including an update by Earl Grinnells and David Mustard, including the dean of the law school, uh, Illinois Law School. This is big time stuff. This is the biggest selling issue, hardcover issue, in the history of the University of Illinois Law School. And when the Illinois Law Review put it online, after about two or three weeks, it was taken down by, the by gambling hackers. Why? Because it's good. They don't want you to read it. This is the update. This is the current information. And uh, Christy, where did you go? Are you still here? She, she's an attorney. I, I was going to ask her how many copies she picked up. 
it was at least three or four or five. This makes lawyers melt. Come on, Paul. Do you know what I'm talking about, legal, legal? The, an entire issue of the law review, biggest seller, taken down by the industry. Well, I will finish up with, with uh, two quick things. Uh, the first thing is that, in fact, we talked about this on a strategic economic level. Uh, the uh, Les Bernal and his group were fundamental in when the Commodities Futures Trading Commission tried to create these bogus stocks uh, based on gambling. Uh, what was that, 2019? I think so, yeah. About 2019, they took it down with their objections to the commission. Uh, but they're back, and they'll keep coming back trying to create these bogus financial instruments, and this is a message that needs to get to the Congress. I hope it resonates with them. And I will end on the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal on Super Bowl weekend comes out with a, an article saying, quote, the delays in sports betting means that sports books are one or two plays ahead of millions of viewers. So streaming sports gamblers are quote unquote dead in the water. This is called past posting, which means they're betting on things that have already happened. And so the sports books are only going to take the bet if the sports book's going to win the bet. And according to the Wall Street Journal, the implication is millions of people cheat, 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 cheat. Come on, all of you people out there gambling. Do you think you're being treated fairly? I think I would almost end with that. The last thing I would mention, particularly for our friends from the UK, is back in the 1990s, we had the National Gambling Impact Study Commission. Went from 1995 to 1999. This organization was instrumental in getting this thing through the US Congress, and it s predicts everything that I have just said, and more negatives. And they've all, they've all been coming to pass. And the Illinois Law Review, which I held up, uh, actually the, the title of the symposium is the Prescient National Gambling Impact Study Commission saying, you were right. And it's even worse than what you predicted. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your interest and your attention. I appreciate it. And I will defer to my colleague, John. My dissertation in public policy was on the economic impact of casinos, and that's what I want to talk with you about today. Um, I have a whole presentation that has been videoed. It's online on the Stop Predatory Gambling website today. I'll just give you a, uh, the synopsis of it. And start with, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be in this fight. I have never wanted to be in this fight. I don't care about this issue. But I care about honesty and truth and good information. I care about decision making based on truth. And I don't see it on this issue. And that's what keeps pulling me back in when I try to leave. I've been involved with fights with Pat Lunger in Nebraska for 25 years uh, because uh, because the arguments that the other side comes out with, I think that can't be right. And, and how come nobody's speaking up? Then I told you before, I love being in the room with all of you because you are speaking up and you are speaking out. People don't know. So this claim, a casino's gonna bring economic development, just always stuck in my craw, I couldn't see it. If I put a casino in Lincoln, Nebraska, people in Lincoln, Nebraska could gamble there, how is that gonna develop anything? And yet they had these you know, big presentations, they had these big glitzy reports, uh, wonderful media campaigns. Um, so I did a study, I got a hold of data from the state of Iowa, it was retail sales data. And Iowa had jumped in with casinos third after Atlantic City and sort of started off this modern push. And I, I like Iowa, but I don't like them for that. They, uh, 
they put casinos in a number of cities, which is great. So I could get these data, retail sales data for these cities and then for the cities that didn't have it. And let's see what happens, right? And over time, they'd had casinos since the mid-1990s. So, so we got about five, six years of data. Um, Compare the two cities. What happens with retail sales? And what happens with retail sales in Iowa was um, before any casinos went in, there was sort of a steady growth rate in retail sales. The towns were growing. After casinos went in, the, the cities without casinos continued this sort of steady, yeah, okay, this way, left and right, this sort of steady growth rate. But the, 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 the cities with the casinos had this wonderful growth rate until the casinos went in and then it flattened. And it was virtually every city with a casino that that happened to. And it was, this was information we used in the fight in Nebraska. It didn't really get a lot, of, a lot of press anywhere else. But so this was always kind of stuck in my craw. And I had an opportunity as I was teaching at Boise State University uh, to work on a doctorate in public policy. And this is what I wanted to study. And I studied it. Uh, I thought, how hard can this be, right? We'll just get the retail sales data for all the towns in the country and then compare them with the ones with casinos without casinos. And we'll see how it comes out. Easy sneezy. <laughs> well. I've learned a lot about research. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, that data doesn't exist. Every state collects it differently. Iowa just, I was fortunate. They actually collected it at state level. I tried to do it in Idaho. After I moved there, and, and Idaho collects retail sales by company, not by geography. So I couldn't get, I, could, I mean, the data doesn't exist that way. And I thought, OK, how am I going to do this study? And I looked a lot of places, and I found that the, uh, Census Bureau does a, a survey of businesses every five years, and among the things that the information they gather is retail sales, and that is geographic based. In fact, it's, it's, it's geographic based in a really cool way for my purposes, because it's not just for this city or this county, which are sort of artificial constraints, but it's for an economic area. It's a, a hub city with the other cities that kind of feed into that hub city, so it's a local economy. Perfect, that's what I want to know. What's the impact of a casino on a local economy? So now I got this local economy data every five years for, for 15 years. Now I just need to know where the casinos are. Somebody must have that somewhere, right? Have, if I'd have known you then, Nan. <laughs> are you a doctor today, Dan? Sorry? Is it, do you have a doctorate? Should I say doctor today? I would have called you right away and that would have cleared it up, but I didn't know and I, I ended up creating this database by finding many different sources and when did the casinos open? Because you got to know that they're there in order to tell if they're affecting the retail sales data. But I finally got to put that together and ran the analysis um, and, and, and here's the result, right? The, the claim is it's going to create economic development and jobs. The reality is there is no evidence for that. Now, granted, I took Las Vegas, I took Atlantic City out of the equation and a couple other places that are clearly destination casinos. People are coming in, losing money, and going home. That's not the typical casino in this company. We have a 1,000 casinos across the country. Most of them, people are gambling from the local area. And that's what I wanted to look at. What's, what's the impact on the local economy? There's no sign that having a casino in any way increased the growth rate of retail sales in casino economies versus non-casino economies. In fact, what we found was that during the Great Depression, 2007 to 2012, the casino economies, I gotta say this in the right order, the growth rate in retail sales in the casino economies was two to three times lower than in the non-casino economies. So the casino economies were actually acting as a drag on the economy at the time when the economy's at its worst. Right? It makes bad times worse. It doesn't make good times better, but it makes bad times worse in terms of its impact on retail sales. And in terms of its impact on employment, uh, the casino economies hired fewer people over time. The growth rate in employment in those economies was lower than the growth rate in the economies without casinos. So it's not adding jobs and it's not improving the economy. The whole notion of economic development and jobs is a marketing campaign. It's not supported by the evidence. That's what I got to say. So are any, any questions for these two economists in regards to the economics of 
commercialized gambling industry and its impact on communities. Pat Lunger. I want John Kent to tell how he got that information into every representative in, in Washington, D.C. A absolutely. I didn't do it. There was a lady by the name of Pat Luncher who has congressional connections and got copies of the Illinois Law Review throughout the entire House of Representatives to, I believe, every office, as well as on the Senate side uh, with helpers uh, with her or associated with her. And uh, it does get the attention of lawyers uh, on Capitol Hill, and it should get the attention of, of people in the UK. Um, this, this is good legal stuff. And let me just make two summary points. On a, an electronic gambling device takes in, a, we say slot machine, takes in $50,000 on average per year with a multiplier effect in economics of three, that's a lost consumer spending of $150,000 a year. So when they say they're bringing in a thousand slot machines, that's a thousand jobs you're losing from the consumer economy every year. And those, those monies just go to buy more slot machines in other jurisdictions and make things worse and worse. Uh, so that's, that's an easy number to remember. The other one is there's just mounds of evidence that for every one dollar in benefits to the state, the costs are at least three to twelve dollars in bankruptcies, new addicted gamblers, new social problems, increases across the board. It makes everything worse. And uh, for government to, to go this route, like John, uh, it, it just infuriates ac academics to see what's happening here because there's, there's just nothing behind it except corruption and big money. Other questions? Uh, Joe Rose. Uh, um, we had, we fought this issue out in, in Buffalo, New York, where I'm from. And I think one of the things that happened, I, I'm put in mind of this by your reference to leaving out Las Vegas because that's a destination. There's a certain fantasy that takes hold that you're going to become the next Las Vegas, or, uh, that people are going to, that Buffalo will become a destination city because of gambling. Um, in fact, Buffalo has become something of a destination city because of, of historical architecture. But, and of course, that, that, that's another whole problem because it means in terms of putting together the argument, you've got confounding things going on. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have that, that, that occurs in spite of the casino. Should, Pardon me? That, that your, your success as a city has occurred in spite of the casino. Exactly. Not because of the casino. Yeah. But it does happen. I understand. Uh, yeah. And, understand. You know, no thanks to government. I, right. I, I, I might add. That, uh, yeah. John's research, your dissertation, is that where is that available? Um, you can see the, the, my presentation of it online at the Stop Red Door Gambling yeah, right. website. Okay. And on in there, on the first slide, the last slide, has a link you can pick it up off of the uh, off of the internet. Or just Google my name and, and economic impact, and it yeah. shouldn't be too far off the top. Okay. Any last quick thoughts before we break up? Let me, let me just say uh, uh, it was a real pleasure recently to see Jeannie Siever and Moms Against Gambling utilize this research very effectively in front of legislative personnel.